All right, friends, it's Miss Mag. Hi, hello, everybody who's watching, whether you're my student or not, or a parent. Hey, what's up? And look what we got, our new unit, guys, chains. And if you're watching this video, you probably already experienced the launch. And we looked at some very difficult images and we listened to some folks talk about modern day slavery and also the history of slavery, specifically here in our great city of New York. And so you're all ready to start Chains. And so we're going to dive right into chapter one of Chains. The first thing I want to do is tell you that the aim today is, let me go back. My computer just did something really weird. So I need to go back. Identify narrative elements introduced in the exposition of a story or a narrative. And we know that the exposition is that first part of the story, the first couple of pages or the first few paragraphs where the author introduces you to the protagonist. And we know that is the main character and other supporting characters. We also get some information about setting. We get a little hint of emerging conflict or what the main character might struggle with um, as their story unfolds for us. And we also get a little bit of background information. And that background information is usually stuff that is really important to the story, but that really happens before the story begins or before we begin our connection to the story. And so as I read and as you read with me, and you should have your book with you and something to write with, okay? And a highlighter, if you use a highlighter to annotate, so that you get all of the information that I'm giving as I read. And so we are looking for evidence of the expositional elements at the beginning of the story. Where is it taking place? What is the time period? Who is the protagonist? What is he or she going to be struggling with? And in this case, it's a she, Isabel. And also, what background information do we find out about Isabel's story? before the story begins. So let's get to it. Chapter one, guys, chains. I'm excited, aren't you? Here we go. Oh, don't forget my cup of knowledge is always here with me. Happy Wednesday, guys. Chapter one, May, Monday, May 27th, 1776. Youth is the seed time of good habits as well as nations as in individuals. Thomas Paine common sense. And so something that I'm noticing right away is that at the beginning of this chapter, there's an excerpt from a primary source document that gives me the date and day. That's also a part of setting. So we know that this story is taking place or at least beginning on May 17th, 1776. A really important element of the exposition is time. Here we go. The best time to talk to ghosts is just before the sun comes up. That's when they can hear us true, Mama said. That's when ghosts can answer us. The eastern sky was peach colored, but a handful of lazy stars still blinked in the west. It was almost time. May I run ahead, sir? I asked. Pastor Weeks sat at the front of his squeaky wagon with old Ben next to him the mule's reins loose in his hands. The pine coffin that held Miss Mary Finch wearing her best dress with her hair washed clean and combed bounced in the back when the wagon wheels hit the rut. My sister Ruth sat next to the coffin. Ruth was too big to carry, plus our pastor knew about her particular manner of being. So it was the wagon for her and the road for me. Old Ben looked to the east and gave me a little nod. He knew a few things about ghosts too. Pastor Weeks turned around to talk to Mr. Robert Finch, who rode his horse a few lengths behind the wagon. The child wants to run ahead, Pastor explained to him. She has kin buried there. Do you give her leave for a quick visit? Okay, hold the phone people. Already, I'm noticing some things. Firstly, we had some very beautiful and descriptive language about the sun setting. All of that is a part of setting. We know that 
Isabel is our main character and that she is walking and her sister Ruth is in the cab in the wagon riding. We've also met a Mr. Weeks or a Pastor Weeks and we've also met uh, Mr. Robert Finch. Um, so those are a couple of characters that would be listed in your exposition. Um, and I also think what's interesting is that the pastor asks this Robert Finch character if it's all right for the child to run ahead. Really interesting. Not sure what that's about. I definitely also came across the word, the word kin, which is another word for family. So make a note of that. Kin, draw a little circle around that. And in your column, just that means family. Top of page four. Mr. Roberts' mouth tightened like a rope pulled taut. He had showed up a few weeks earlier to visit Miss Mary Finch, his aunt, and only live in relation. He looked around her tidy farm, listened to her ragged, wet cough, and moved in. Miss Mary wasn't even cold on her deathbed when he helped himself to the coins in her strong box. He buried her. He hurried along, burying her too. Most improper. He didn't care that our neighbors would want to come around with cakes and platters of cold meat and drink ale to the memory of Miss Mary Finch of Toe, Rhode Island. He had to get on with things, he said. I stole a look backward. Mr. Robert Finch was filled up with trouble from his dirty boots to the brim of his scraggly hat. Please, sir, I said. Go on then, he said, but don't tarry. I have much business today. I ran as fast as I could. Now, let's go back and figure out what is happening. So the main character, and I already slipped and said her name was Isabel, but we haven't learned that yet, but now you know, okay? So we Isabel wants to run ahead of the wagon, of the horse and wagons, because she has Ken buried there. So we know someone has died. We know that this is Robert Finch's aunt right? Because he's her nephew. Um, and we also get a little bit of information about the fact that someone who's related to Isabel has also died. And we know that from that line from the pastor where he says um, she has kin buried there. And I'm assuming he means in the graveyard. So they're in the wagon. Apparently they're headed to the graveyard to bury Mary Finch. And we know that Mary Finch is Robert Finch's auntie. And we also learned that the main character wants to run ahead so that she can pay respects to her kin. We don't know who that is, but we know that kin means family or relation. And so we'll find that out, I think, very shortly. I hurried past the stone fence that surrounded the white graveyard to the split rail fence that marked our ground and stopped outside the gate to pick a handful of chilly violets, wet with dew. The morning mist twisted and hung low over the field, no ghost yet, just ash trees and maples lined up in a mournful row. I entered. Mama was buried in the back, her feet to the east, her head to the west. Someday I would pay the stone car before a proper marker with her name on it. Dinah, wife of coffee, mother of Isabel and Ruth. For now, there was a wooden cross and a gray rock the size of a dinner plate lying flat on the ground in front of it. We had buried her the year before when the first roses bloomed. Now, we know that Isabel wants to run ahead so that she can visit her mother's grave. Guys, this is background information. We know now that her mother won't necessarily be a part of the story as a living character, but she is a part of the story as she appears in the exposition as background information. So let's read on and see if we learn more about Isabel's mom. Smallpox is tricky, Miss Mary Finch said to me when mama died. There's no telling who it will take. The pox had left Ruth and me with scars like tiny stars scattered on our skin. It took mama home to our maker. I looked back at the road. Old Ben had slowed the mules to give me time. I knelt down and set the violets on the grave. It's here, Mama, I whispered, the day you promised, but I need your help. Can you please cross back over for just a little bit? I stared without blinking at the mist, looking for the curve of her back or the silhouette of her head wrapped in a pretty handkerchief. 
A small flock of robins swooped out of the maple trees. I don't have much time, I told the grass-covered grave. Where do you want us to go? What should we do? The mist swirled between the tall grass and the low-hanging branches. Two black butterflies danced through a cloud of bugs and disappeared. Chickadees and barn swallows called overhead. Whoa! Old Ben stopped the wagon next to the open hole near the iron fence, then climbed down and walked to where Nehemiah, the grave digger, was waiting. The two men reached for the coffin. Please, Mama, I whispered urgently. I need your help. I squinted into the ash grave where the mist was heaviest. No ghosts, nothing. Okay, so let's stop for a minute and figure out what's happening here. What is Isabel doing? So is her mother at the graveyard, like sitting in a chair and listening to her? Or is she kneeling before her mother's grave and talking to her? And guys, sometimes we do that. Sometimes when we lose a loved one, we may have a particular ritual or tradition in our family to every so often, sometimes once a year on their birthday, Sometimes people do it at the beginning of a new year. You go to their grave and you visit the grave. And sometimes part of the ritual of visiting someone's grave is literally having a conversation with that person, okay? And this is what Isabel is doing. She's talking to her mother and she's asking her mother for advice. She's asking her mother, please come to me and please give me advice about where we should go. So I think it's important to note that this is part of the background information that Halls Anderson has created for this character. And it gives you a little insight into the relationship between Isabel and her mother. But we also have another death that's being thought about and dealt with in this first chapter, and that is the death of Miss Mary Finch. And so far, the only thing we know about Mary Finch is that she is the auntie or the relative of Robert Finch. Okay. I've been making like this for near a year. No matter what I'd said or where the sun and the moon and the stars hung, Mama never answered. Maybe she was angry because I buried her wrong. I'd heard stories of old country burials with singers and dancers, but I wasn't sure what to do, so we just dug a hole and said a passel of prayers. Maybe Mama's ghost was lost and wandering because I didn't send her home the right way. Okay, so let me stop here. This was a tradition, particularly in the South or among slaves, where their relatives were buried in a certain way and certain dances and certain rituals had to be performed at those funerals or what we call now funerals in order for that person to rest in peace. And so Isabel is wondering if perhaps she's done something wrong in terms of how she buried her mother because her mother is not answering her questions and her requests. The men set Miss Mary's coffin on the ground. Mr. Robert got off his horse and said something I couldn't hear. Ruth stayed in the wagon, her bare feet curled up under her skirt and her thumb in her mouth. I reached in the pocket under my apron and took out the oat cake. It was in two pieces with honey smeared between them. The smell made my stomach rumble but I didn't dare nibble. I picked up the flat rock in front of the cross and set the offering in the hollow under it. Then I put the rock back and sat still. My eyes closed tight to keep the tears inside my head where they belonged. I could smell the honey that had dripped on my hand, the damp ground under me and the salt of the ocean. I could hear cows mooing in the far pasture and bees buzzing in a nearby clover patch. If she would just say my name just once. Girl, Mr. Roberts shouted, you there, girl. I sniffed, opened my eyes, and wiped my face on my sleeve. The sun had popped up in the east like a cork and was burning through the morning mist. The ghosts had all gone to ground. I wouldn't see her today either. He grabbed my arm and pulled me roughly to my feet. I told you to move. Mr. Roberts snarled at me. Apologies, sir, I said, wincing with pain. He released me with a shove and pointed to the cemetery where they buried white people. Go pray for her. That owned you, girl. Woo, that's a lot. Okay, so let's go back. We know that sort of we're honoring 
or we're revering two deaths in this chapter. Isabel is thinking about the death of her mother a year ago from smallpox and wants to visit her grave as they are bringing her previous owner, Miss Mary Finch, to bury her as well. And so Isabel has this exchange with her mother, asking her mother, please to show herself, please give me a sign, please answer my questions, I need your help. And she's sort of shaken out of that sort of daydream or prayer by Mr. Finch grabbing her up and shoving her and telling her to go pay her last respects for them that owned you. And so Miss Mary Finch is revealed as Isabel and Ruth's owner and has just died. So that really wraps it up for chapter one. Pretty short and straightforward chapter. We're probably going to take another look at this chapter in class and answer some questions about exposition. So I want you to be thinking very intentionally about setting. Um, Halls Anderson does a really beautiful job with describing the setting. You can almost hear and smell, you can almost hear the sounds of the mule uh, plodding along in the dust and smell the lilies that Isabel places on her mother's um, gravestone. And I can almost taste the oat cake um, drizzled with honey uh, that she places before her mother's grave as an offering, as was the tradition among enslaved people at that time, to visit a grave and bring some kind of offering. People would bring flowers. Sometimes pictures, people would bring pictures of themselves and that particular loved one whose grave um, they were in. And so this was a part of the ritual of her uh, sort of mourning for her mother and asking for help and then also sort of saying goodbye again. So that's chapter one. Hope you picked up on exposition. See you in class tomorrow, guys.